It's time for the Talent Talk Radio Show, brought to you by People G2, a nationwide leader in background checks and employment screening solutions. People G2 gives their clients access to the best human capital management and due diligence tools available. They are dedicated to helping their clients with all of their people-related decisions. To learn more, go to www.peopleg2.com. Talent Talk centers on the topics of talent recruitment and management, leadership development, company culture, and employee engagement. These are all timely topics for CEOs, entrepreneurs, HR professionals, and business leaders. We hope that as you tune in to listen each week, whether to the live broadcast or to the podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio, that you hear something you can take away that will help you grow and impact your career in a positive way. And now, here's the host of the Talent Talk Radio Show, the founder and CEO of People G2, Chris Dyer. Good afternoon and welcome to Talent Talk. We are excited to be back live on the on the radio here today. And of course, we are live streaming this to LinkedIn, to Twitter, to YouTube, to Facebook. It's all over the place. So if you're listening live, great. If you catch us on a podcast on Spotify or iHeartRadio or Stitcher or wherever, cool. And if you want to watch on the video and want to see us, see our, our lovely faces, you can do that. They're literally everywhere, um, so there's no excuse not uh, if you want to be a part of the conversation. Now, we will be uh, updating everyone with the best uh, comments, the best links, maybe profile links, book links, things like that on Twitter. We try to do as much as we can inside of LinkedIn as well. Um, and so if you want to be kind of up, kept up to speed of some of those things, make sure you are monitoring us there on those platforms for all the best stuff, at PeopleG2 on Twitter. Angela, my uh, social media guru, is keeping all that stuff uh, up to date. Now, we are so fortunate to have the incredible guests every single uh, week. And in fact, we've gotten so many stories over the years. Uh, a lot of them have gone into my first two books. They were bestsellers. The first one was The Power of Company Culture, and the second one was Remote Work. So if those two topics are of interest to you, you know where to go, go on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. Love to have you check them out and let us know what you think. Now, we are live every Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you have a guest suggestion, if you think we should be talking to someone, let us know. Reach out. That's how we get some of our best ideas is, is from the audience. In fact, there's over 10,000 of you a day downloading at least one of our shows. Millions of downloads a year. And we're just so thankful to everyone who's a part of the Talent Talk family, part of uh, uh, this group of people who want to learn, who want to hopefully get something that they can take back to their businesses and implement with their people. And that's really why we're here is to talk to these smart people who understand business, who understand talent, who have something to say inside of that space. So today my guest uh, will be Brent Oakley. He's a co-CEO of Vibonomics. And then after the commercial break, we'll bring in Andy uh, Malonsky, organization and cross-cultural psychologist at uh, Brandeis. And he's also an author, so I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. But let's go ahead and bring in Brent. Welcome, sir, to the Town Talk Radio Show. Thank you, Chris. Good to be here. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about you? I kind of gave you a little bit of an intro there, but what's important for us to know about you, uh, especially as it relates to our conversation today? Yeah, great. Well, first and foremost, I guess uh, I'm a father. Uh, so I have uh, two kiddos, uh, 12 and 10 years old, so they keep me busy. Um, I also have a, uh, a wife of 20 years that has built an extraordinary company uh, over her last 20 years of building a really big business. It's been fun to watch her build something magical from about three employees all the way up to over 500. So it's been fun in watching that. And then uh, I cut my teeth being an entrepreneur about uh, 12 years ago, starting Prime Car Wash, uh, building a high-end uh, car wash company uh, with locations in both Indiana and Florida. And then uh, recently, as of five years ago, I've spent all of my energy, time, and passion into building Vibonomics uh, and excited to talk with you about it today. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you can kind of tell us a bit more about what, what does Vibonetics do? Or what's the, the point of the company? Like what, you know, what, what, are, what sort of solutions are you delivering to your clients? Yeah. So Vibonomics is a software that controls audio retail locations across the country, primarily in grocery stores, pharmacies, 
and convenience stores. And we network all of those locations together to essentially create an audio out of home advertising media system that advertisers and brands and everybody can jump on in real time and, and advertise. Um, so it, it's really not been done before. Uh, it's, it's a traditional broadcast type of mentality in the audio space. Um, and what we've been able to do is bring that world of retail media into uh, the light of, of digital uh, advertising today. So, you know, as a CEO, uh, what sort of qualities outside of the maybe the basics are you looking for when you're hiring talent? You have a, this like you said, a new new service here. This is something that hasn't been done. You work with maybe very traditional businesses. Um, so what, what are you looking for when you're hiring? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, what we try to do, or, or me specifically, I've always hired for the person first. Um, I, I hire for the actual job skill secondly, uh, meaning if, if somebody comes in, I'm a very high energy person. And if, if somebody's coming into the organization with a tremendous amount of energy and they bring that, that piece of it forward, they already have a leg up in the organization. As most people and, and your listeners would appreciate, building a startup company is, is very difficult. There's lots of pivots. There's lots of, of times to, to move and shift gears. And if you really have somebody that comes in that is only specific uh, on certain things, um, and that's the majority of your people, it really makes it cha challenging to make those incredible pivots. All the way down to our engineers and, and designers, you know, the, the people that we hired in uh, to the company were so capable of doing a multitude of different design work and uh, working on different projects, which they've had to do since the beginning. Um, so when, when I look for things, I'm looking for those, those multi-dimensional players that can uh, pick up concepts very quickly, uh, put it in application fast, and they do it with a positive, good energy about themselves. Well, you're describing probably a type of person most of us would like to hire that they're, they're, they're good, they're, they're a utility player, they can come in and do lots of different things and, and do their job well. So how are you attracting this kind of talent? Where are you going to you know, try to find these kinds of people? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. The, the lucky thing for us, uh, we've been very fortunate for sure, is just by nature, we're, we're a music company. So uh, we're cool, but it's just music's <laughs> fun, music's cool. Um, we are also a, an advertising company. So we get all of the, the fun energy of, of advertising and being this media platform and then couple that all with the fact that we're a software company, uh, which is kind of all the rage at, at this point. So we bring that together um, and we really make a point that we, we start off on the right foot a lot times but essentially what we are are really trying to do we are in Indianapolis it is a ch tough tough job market and I know it's tough for everybody out there but certainly being in the Midwest um, you know we're, we're we are lucky enough that we have tremendous universities around here and uh, we've been able to really tap into Butler and Purdue University and um, Indiana University and some of the other great universities so it's really getting uh, people that are, are here early and allowing them to grow with us and mature and grow up through the, the ranks. Um, and I have, you know, umpteen st stories of, of people who have started the company with us long ago. And even if they didn't necessarily stay here um, and uh, you, you don't retain them, what I always take pride in is knowing that they've grown and they've gone out and told our story. They've become bigger at some other company. They've become better opportunities. Those people tend to send us people as well. So uh, there's just so many avenues and verticals that you, your, your company and your own employees have to be your biggest ambassadors of what you do. Um, they, and that's really where we start growing organically throughout the, the community and the, the Indianapolis market and Indiana market. Yeah, and I think it makes sense. I mean, you're you're able to kind of put together some of your strengths, some of the things that make your your company unique or make it cool, uh, and you're you're tapping into uh, you know where you can get talent from. Um, that's always been a big strong point, like you said, for the Midwest with all the universities and 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 that part of it to be able to leverage that. Um, but I think the other part that maybe is the we have a Venn diagram here, right? There's uh, what you do, there's where you can get talent from, and that's probably the vision part, right? Which is, you know, what is your organization trying to do? So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what, what kind of vision do you have in mind for the organization? And how does that kind of align to not just attracting talent, but you have to build teams, you have to get people working together, you have to 
Um, maybe deal with the fact that your vision might change halfway down the line and have to pivot to something else. I mean, so what does that look like internally for, for uh, Vibonomics? Yeah, I think there's a couple points in, in that whole topic and, and one being what's the, the vision for the company and, and who we want to be. Um, you know, that piece of it in itself is, is yes, we have a vision and yes, we want to build a, a really big, important, fascinating company. Um, but really where I get passionate about what we're doing is I'm a very much a community person. Um, I'm, I'm involved in, in local politics here and I, I do understand what it takes to build an ecosystem, uh, especially in a place like Indianapolis that's not uh, you know, West Coast, like where you, you generally think technology and startup companies will come out of. So in order for a place like Indianapolis and Indiana to really thrive and be able to attract talent and get people to come here, you really have to have these breakout companies and these breakout employees that learn how to grow and scale businesses. And then they go on after the big important company sells and they in reinvest some of that money that they earned at the, the company that started. They reinvest their ideas. They go and they help other co-founders. They take big roles on boards. And, um, you know, we got to see this really play out uh, with a company locally called Exact Target that sold to Salesforce uh, for $2.6 billion dollars and the Salesforce moved their second largest headquarters here. What was really fun about that story though is not only yay we had a, a great exciting uh, exit coming out of Indiana, um, really the exciting part was the over 100 uh, millionaires it created, the, all of the, the money went, that went back into the community, uh, all the businesses those people have gone on to build, the incubators that they've started to, to develop more companies. That's the vision I see for the employees here, is that all of these folks are really a part of this ride and we're hitting such a magical moment where the trajectory is gonna start going. And this is where we all get to learn, we get to, to create these experiences with each other so that when we do bring this thing and land this plane, all of these folks are gonna be able to take all of that energy and all of that knowledge and go out and do other things and keep this community and in Indiana thriving as, as a, a tech hub. Yeah, and you know, it, it, things have certainly seem like they've changed in some of the areas that you've been talking about. I know for years that one of the real big challenges organizations had, especially in the Midwest, was how do we create an organization uh, that it can be more inclusive, that can be more diverse, that can have more uh, empowerment through their culture. Um, and and so, is that something you guys feel like you're? You're, you're tackling or that you're succeeding with or what does that look like you know uh, from your perspective yeah it's a that is a it's something that all of us in indiana battle constantly and um you know not only from just a workforce trying to attract talent to come here from outside of this space and we're, we're limited in that piece but diversity is is also something that indiana is not not known for um so in, in thinking through that, you really do have to, to reach out uh, to different verticals, different places that you wouldn't normally think of to, to get um, a, a diverse group of folks. Luckily, again, it goes back to the universities that we have here where you do bring a tremendous amount of diverse talent from all over the world, really, to some of these universities. Now, it's really up to you how you go out and, and try to tackle that to, to br keep them in Indiana because a lot of this young, talented, diverse world doesn't want to stay in Indiana. They want to move out to the coast and then maybe, maybe you bring them back. So I work uh, not only within our own organization to try to figure out this very difficult problem, but um, I belong to a, a group called the ITIA that reports actually directly up through our governor trying to solve this for Indiana. It's a, it's a challenging challenging uh, a thing to, to try to make sure that we are staying um, at the top of the the, the list of people, you know, where you might want to be and where you might want to settle down. Um, what, what do we have to offer here in Indiana to make sure that we're getting the best talent across all diversities to, to come and stay? Um, so more companies like ours, more breakouts like ours, um, con continuing to build the, the infrastructure, continuing to change our laws, quite frankly, uh, here in Indiana that has not always been progressive in, in our thinking, um, has uh, you know caused challenges in what we're doing. So all of those things uh, are important. And the whole point of me being a part of the Indiana Technology Innovation Association is that I wanna make sure that we are not blindsided by laws that we have that are that are hampering 
uh, employees from wanting to be here in Indiana and work and, and be a part of this culture. So we're, we're spending a lot of time. Our governor is doing great at, at really leaning into that and participating with us, our companies, um, to make sure that we're getting the right things on board. Well, it sounds like you're having a lot of success uh, for your organization. <clears throat> you're having a lot of success uh, in, in helping drive some change through even through local politics. Um, uh, but I think our listeners also are also fascinated to know, you know, what, what does someone like you do when maybe they fail? Right. And what does that look like? Do you, do you have a maybe a, a story or a big takeaway you might share with us about uh, maybe something that didn't work out so well? Yeah, it's a it's a fun question, and I, I think about it all the time. We have a lot of of um, things that we run into here at Vibonomics that, you know, from the very beginning of this story, the company was actually called Fusic, and um, we we ran into some some naming problems right out of the <laughs> gates that I didn't want to didn't want to change the name, but ultimately had to. So you had to go through the whole rebranding re piece of it. We've, we've probably pivoted the company four or five different times uh, and gone different directions. So those are all tough ones, but I, I can tell you from my personal standpoint, um, I'd say that the biggest challenges I've had pers personally, and, and this is one of those things where you don't know what you're capable of until you're backed against the corner, um, is when I had first started uh, the idea of building car washes across Indiana, I had already talked to one of my closest friends, uh, a COO, uh, in, in operations into coming and moving his whole family from Florida to come work for me. And then uh, I had talked my father into retiring early and quitting his job to come help me with the maintenance and the setup of the, of the, the entire car wash and the operational part of the system. Um, I had already quit my job where I was a medical device representative and I, I left that job and I did all of these things without securing my, um, my financing partner uh, with the banks. So when I quickly realized that one of my, the people that I thought was going to give me the financing, um, by that time when they finally said no to me, I'd already had all of this stuff in motion. So for basically the next three, four months, I went to 10 banks then 15 banks. That's when panic really set in. It took me 23 bank banks to finally get somebody who would give a, a person with zero experience in this space, four and a half million dollars to go build a car wash. So um, that, was a, uh, that was a lesson in perseverance and just keep going, keep going. And, and when you're backed up against it and you have no other choice, it's amazing how deep you, you will, you will reach down and grind everything out. You know, and sometimes it's that need, right? I mean, I, often a lot of people fail, I think, because they try to make it, whatever they're just trying to do or build perfect before they'll actually go and implement. And that ends up just, you know, perfection is, is, is the killer of innovation. Uh, it's a killer of success, I think, at times. So it sounded no, like you, you didn't have, yeah, you didn't have it all figured out, right? And yet you knew, geez, I've now committed. These people have committed to me. I, I've got to figure out how to get this done. Maybe if those people you hadn't done that and it was just you and you still had your job, you might have just gone to five banks and gone, well, maybe this is, isn't going to work, right? And you're, you may not have ever done it. Right. You're exactly yeah. right. It it really comes down to a, a space where if you have too many safety nets and you have too many places where you can go to get comfortable, then a lot of times you won't let yourself really go to where you need to go um, when you're uncomfortable to push through and, and get things done. Um, and we really, you know, if I look at what we've done at Vibonomics and all those pivots, we, we started out under the idea of something completely different, uh, more or less than we are today. Uh, and we've kind of just taken this odd approach through a whole bunch of, of different twists and turns to get to where we, we are. And we finally hit that target market fit and we've taken off ever since. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's always fun. You know, it's fun and probably also uh, gives you heartburn at the same time being in a startup and having all these different hats to wear, all these different things going on. And I remember we, we, we always think about keeping uh, the spirit of how we interacted with each other when we were very first starting off, that the way we gave each other feedback was so blunt and so direct and so constant, right? When you're starting up, it's like, you just gotta hit, hey, that's just, you can't do that, man. <laughs> that ain't, it's not gonna work. Here's how we do it. Okay, great. And then like years later, like 10 years later, we were like, tiptoeing around people to tell them what we wanted them to know. And I was like, why aren't we just doing what we did way back when, right? So we've sort of taken on that idea of let's let's take feedback, we call it even feed forward, let's take 
that th- those interactions and, and keep that freshness, right, of uh, an importance that we had back during the startup time. What does that look like for you guys now? Is it something similar? Is it different? I mean, how are you handling, you know, that communication and that feedback and that attention to your people? Yeah, you said it perfectly. It, it is, it's amazing what ends up happening um, in the very early stages. Everybody knows everything. You know, when, when you're going to be out of money in two weeks and you don't know how you're going to pay people, <laughs> no, but everybody knows it. I mean, you, you already talked about it. They see you freaking out about it. And what, what is interesting about it is actually as a founder and somebody who's doing that every day, you, you kind of continue that whole cycle of just being completely transparent. And what you don't realize is when you get to a place where there's over 50 people that are, are working for you and um, you know, they all, they, they don't, they're not as close to it as those original five or six that you were just sitting around talking and being like you said, that transparent and brutally honest. So it, it may not be the best thing always to, to share every single detail with them, but we have made it a very, very important part of our, our mission um, from the executive team, to the leadership on down, just that blunt transparency um, and just really tell people where we're at and what's on my mind. And, and you know, I'm not a person that hides when I'm, I'm stressed. I'm not a person that hides very well, um, you know, all the feelings that I'm having in, in the moment. So it's actually easier than making them wonder where my head is to kind of just tell them what I'm, what I'm nervous about and what I'm fearful of. And you, you really do get a lot of response from people when, when you're transparent. Um, and I would, I would add just another piece of it that really has mattered in, in our building process is, you know, you get to a certain point in the organization where my skill set is just not even close to all the things that you need done in an organization that's really going to be best in class in what you're trying to do. You have to go out in this stage when you recruit VC dollars and the expectations are high that you're going to grow quickly. You have to go out and find people who are way better at their craft than you are and what you're trying to accomplish. So bringing those people in, a lot of times you're hiring them over folks who already work in the organization. Every one of those movements gets everybody a little bit uncomfortable. So there's a couple things that still have to happen. That transparency has to be there across the organization of why you're doing it. But then the people that you're bringing in, even if they are hired guns, even if they are folks that know what they're doing, those people have to come in with a lot of humility as well. And that you have to be able to have that blunt conversation of, look, I know you've been here and done this, but it's not gonna look the same. It's not gonna be exactly the same. So let's be open to, to everybody's ideas and, and what we're building together. And if you get that perfect combination of somebody who knows what they're doing, also has a lot of humility and, and understands they, they still have a lot to learn, then you'll be able to bridge that gap and people won't ever feel like you're really just hiring people over them to, to squash them down. Um, and and you, it, takes, it takes a village, it takes all hands. So everybody's gotta feel included. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And there, uh, you know, there's tons of research out there, but essentially there's a direct correlation between, you know, the more transparent you can be to uh, the more successful your organization is, the more market share they have, the more profitable they are. I mean, it's just, there's so, it can be a little difficult sometimes to be as transparent as you need to be. It's not always comfortable, but man, are the benefits there. So uh, we're just about out of time here. I want to make sure we ask the final, most important question is how can people get a hold of you if they're interested in finding out more about Vibonomics? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate it. I'm actually a, a very simple person when it comes to social media and all the things, uh, probably very much unlike you, Chris. I know I was able to find you on several different channels, but <laughs> for me, it's simply just LinkedIn. Uh, and please do. I, I'm very uh, active on LinkedIn. Um, I try to, to get as much information as you might be asking from me. I, I will always be seeking information from all of you for sure. Well, Brent, thank you so much for being our guest today and giving some fantastic insights. We'd love to have you come back at some point. Give us an update on how you guys are doing. And uh, we'll take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with our second guest, uh, Andy Malinsky. Imagine buying a newspaper and discovering that the news you're reading is six months old. There isn't much that stays the same for six months. And the same thing goes for background checks. In a time when so much outdated information is being passed around, it's good to know that People G2 offers something different. At 
People G2, we provide today's intelligence, not yesterday's news. Our value-added approach offers you a fully FCRA-compliant solution that includes up-to-the-minute information. By combining industry-leading technology with old-school human investigation, People G2 is able to give you information that is accurate right now, delivered quickly to our online system, or integrated with your HR system. So ask yourself, are you comfortable working with old news, or are you ready for a different kind of background check company? Visit PeopleG2.com or call 800-630-2880. That's 800-630-2880 or PeopleG2.com. Perfect. All right, we're, uh, we're back here with uh, Andy Malinsky. We're back on the Talent Talk radio show. If you missed my first guest, uh, Brent Oakley, you can listen to his whole interview. You can find the video version on uh, YouTube. You can find it on LinkedIn, Facebook. Twitter, we're broadcasting everywhere. Uh, of course, our podcast is, uh, this live radio show has turned to a podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. Just go there and subscribe to make sure you never miss a show wherever you feel like interacting with us. Don't forget, we're also live tweeting all of this. So if you want to interact with us on Twitter, ask a question, maybe interact with us, suggest a guest for future episode, uh, at PeopleG2 is the best place to do that. Um, all right, like I said, my next guest is Andy Malinsky. He's the organizational and cross-cultural psychologist at Brandeis, and he's an author of Global Dexterity and Reach. So uh, welcome to the show, sir. I'm glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about more about you, what's important for us to know about you, your background, what you, you're passionate about, so we can kind of frame this conversation correctly. Sure. Yeah. By day, I'm a professor uh, in a business school, organizational psychology. By night, well, not necessarily by night. <laughs> by <laughs> when I'm not when I'm not doing that, I've written a couple of books. I'm very in- popular business books. I'm really interested in the the idea of stepping outside your comfort zone. Originally, your cultural comfort zone. So that was my book, Global Dexterity, and then my book, Reach, was about just your comfort zone. Period. I do a lot of teaching and training and consulting and coaching and all sorts of things around those topics. Yeah, and it's interesting you talked about stepping out of your comfort zone. We were just talking about that with Brent, the first guest, you know, about how he had to step out of his comfort zone. And maybe if he had stayed in it, he maybe not have ever even started a business. So, hmm. um, you know, why, why is it important from your perspective to learn how to step outside of your, your personal comfort zone? And also, uh, you, you mentioned your cultural comfort zone, which I think is super important as well. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what I, I don't want people to come away with the idea that that, that I'm saying, you know, you, 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 life only begins outside your comfort zone. If you look on the internet, you'll find memes about that. I'm, I'm not saying get out of your comfort zone in every way, in any way possible. But w- w- when, when you have a goal, when, you, when you're when you trying to do something, when you're trying to grow and learn and develop, achieve something, uh, this happens throughout our lives. It happens when we uh, st- start, start a new job, start a new role leave our job and start something entirely new we're going to encounter situations that w- w- we're in order to succeed and achieve our goals we're going to have to step outside our comfort zone that might mean um you know i don't know trying to trying to pitch your idea to venture capitalists if you're an entrepreneur it might mean um delivering bad news when that's not kind of your go-to strategy maybe you're a people pleaser it might mean networking uh actively when you hate to do that you hate to toot your own horn whatever it is they're sort of like these everyday acts of courage that enable us to ultimately achieve our goals yeah yeah absolutely and you know it's it's interesting if you think about it you mentioned entrepreneurs i think we all think about maybe our high achievers we think about people who are trying to do these big giant things but that's not actually what how most people are maybe interacting with your business your average employee maybe isn't trying to be an entrepreneur tomorrow maybe isn't trying to be the ceo in five years or or whatever for them stepping out of their comfort zone might be i just need work to be stable and okay and what and what i'm trying to do is like you know, raise a family by myself. I might be a single parent. I might be, you know, someone who has a sick spouse or a sick parent I'm taking care of. And like, so where that comfort zone, you know, kind of plays, I think it's really important to understand for each person, what does that mean for them, right? Um, because they may not be trying to climb a ladder at work. And we might be, I, I remember having a lot of like discomfort with people. I was like, aren't you trying to progress? Aren't you trying to get a promotion? And I was like, well, that's not what every, necessarily what everybody wants. So how do we sort of like maybe tailor that 
to different people, right? How do we figure out where they want to maybe grow or change and at the same time support them where they don't? Well, I, th I think sometimes, so, so first of all, it's tricky because I think oftentimes we do uh, sculpt our lives to avoid things that are outside our comfort zone. Mm. And then we rationalize to ourselves that, oh, it's not that important that I do this. It's not that important that I do that. And to the extent that we have leeway to do that, we, we, we do that. Um, I think a good question to ask yourself in a particular situation, in a particular circumstance is if you had some sort of like magic eraser and you could erase the anxiety just for a moment, just this is a thought exercise. Is this something you'd love to be able to do? <laughs> is this some, is this is this task? Is this situation? Is this something that you'd love to be able to do? And, and if the answer is yes, um, bring back the anxiety and let's work on it. Let's work on trying to find a way for you to to, to overcome what I call the psychological roadblocks and involved in stepping outside your comfort zone and come up with a strategy that works for you. Yeah, um, and that can be really. Um, it can be really difficult, I guess, to kind of figure out what to do. You know, where do we want to step out? Where where are we maybe, like you said, lying to ourselves about where we should be stepping out, right? And that sometimes it takes, I find it takes asking the question of someone who is doing that, right? Because I think we can go to our friends, we can go to our family, and they'll tell us what they think we want to hear. But I've sort of found that it's been mentors and it's been colleagues that are CEOs or the people that were the ones who would push a button, right? That would say, well, why haven't you done this thing yet? Why haven't you taken that step forward? Um, whereas my wife would be like, well, if you don't want to, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No. It's true. It's it's uh, it's and it's it's collecting and finding the right types of people. I find that there can be, you can have mentors in your life who really do get you, understand you, can empathize, but also can nudge. You know, can sort of push you a little bit. Um, the danger sometimes with mentors is that mentor, if, if it's an older mentor and someone who's already gone through whatever it's whatever you're struggling with now, and it's been a long time they might have lost touch with what the challenges actually are. So they might not have sort of their finger on the pulse of what it's like to be in your shoes. I think the best mentors can do that, can still empathize and also, you know, give us that push, give us that nudge and also help, help us develop a strategy that works for us. Yeah. And what are some of the biggest challenges that people tend to face as they're moving through this uh, process of, of stepping out of their comfort zone? So in my book, in my book, Reach, um, uh, I did a lot of research. I interviewed 100 people across different professions uh, about what the struggles they had stepping outside their comfort zone. I found five key uh, challenges. One is authenticity, that whatever in this situation, I don't feel like myself and that that's a barrier. These can create negative emotions. Uh, Likeability. What if, what if people don't like this version of me? Like, let's say stepping outside your comfort zone has to do with being more assertive than you usually are. Well, what if people don't like that version of me? I'm not usually assertive, right? You could be terrified about that and therefore not do it. Competence. You could struggle with competence, worry that you're not going to be good at this, or maybe worry others will see that. Uh, resentment. Sometimes people struggle with resentment. Logically, they get it. You know, when in Rome, act like the Romans. I know I need to do this, whatever it might be, but, but psychological. Logically, I'm like, you know, I wish I, it, it really annoys me that I have to make small talk with the boss in order to get the best assignments. Can't my qualifications just stand on their own? Um, so, so those are some examples in morality is the last one. Some, sometimes in certain cases, um, stepping outside your comfort zone sort of like feels wrong. In fact, I opened my book, Reach, with a story about this. A young woman who was an entrepreneur, started a business. One of her best friends was her first hire, and she ultimately realized that her best friend was kind of bringing the business down, and she had to fire her best friend. She felt she felt inauthentic. She worried about likability. She worried about competence, and she also felt she was doing something wrong. That is a big burden, and that's why people avoid. Why, you know, if, if you think approach avoid, you know, you're feeling all these things. You know, that's why people avoid delay you know so yeah and we all as as the human experience I, I one of the biggest things i ever learned was that people basically spend their entire day avoiding pain <laughs> trying yeah. to avoid discomfort right and so that's a really good thing to understand if you're selling to people right how can you help them eliminate pain eliminate discomfort um but yeah they're, they're 
So it's hard for them to maybe push through and do something that will really help them because it can be painful. I mean, I can't even imagine having to fire your best friend who you thought would be great for your business. And then it turned out, man, this just isn't the right fit. And it's tricky because there's a short-term gain, short-term benefit. When you avoid something, the short-term benefit is is relief, right? right. <laughs> so it's like self-reinforcing. So you're like, Oof, I don't have to do that. But the problem is, of course, the problem is likely not going to go away. You know, and so the next time around, it will be even more challenging to do. And that's that's what I call the vicious cycle of avoidance that people can get into. Um, I help people through my writing, through my work, through my teaching and coaching and so on. To, I help people break that. Yeah. Well, I, I, either to areas that maybe people shouldn't be thinking about getting outside of a comfort zone. I mean, is there places where they should, you know, stay right where they're at? Absolutely. I think so. You know, I, I wrote a Harvard Business Review article a couple of years ago about that exact topic because I started thinking to myself, gosh, I don't want everyone to think that I'm like the step outside your comfort zone guy. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there are circumstances, you know, maybe it's not the right time for you. Uh, maybe, you know, I remember, for instance, early in my career, I'm an academic and I was writing all these academic papers and I always wanted to do stuff for the general public. But I had like two little kids. My wife and I were like trying to juggle a gajillion things. And like, was that the time for me to step outside my comfort zone? Probably not. Right. So th so there's a there's 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 um you want to pick your battles. You want to pick your choices. You want to set yourself up for success. And so I think that that judiciously, it's a great idea to pick a couple key arenas to step outside your comfort zone and set yourself up for success. Yeah, yeah, and and that's really important. So you know, it, this is a, much like you know, hey, go set some goals for yourself, whatever those goals are, and then figure out what you need to do to get those done. And that's where maybe you need to think about, okay, I'm going to have to stretch here. I'm going to have to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to have to. You know, maybe I'm going to have to go and talk to 500 people and I hate talking to people, but that's the only way I'm going to grow a business or that's the only way I'm going to, you know, find a mentor or whatever that thing may be. Um, I, I mean, maybe you want to find a spouse that can, you know, haven't left the house in a month. That's going to be a little difficult. So, you know, whatever those things are, you're going to have to figure that out. You know, one thing I was curious to ask you, um, and, and this is sort of a little different from your uh, does it really connect with you being an author or your or particular expertise? But as someone who is in education in, in, in colleges, I'm sort of wondering what you're seeing right now with, with college students as it relates to, to COVID and how things are changing and virtual learning. Um, are, are you seeing this as maybe an opportunity for them and for the schools to, to do things differently, I guess stepping out of their comfort zone, or has it been, you know, maybe more a negative, right? Where it's get back to how it was before. What are you sort of seeing inside the world of, of, of the universities? Well, I think when COVID first happened, everyone suddenly needed to step outside their comfort zone. I know from my perspective as a professor, I, 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 I had to learn Zoom, I had to learn to teach in Zoom, and I had to learn to connect with people on Zoom or, you know, virtually, which is, which is challenging to do. And it wasn't just me. It was all, you know, the entire world of teachers, um, trainers, coaches, and so on, doctors, but um, had to sort of use this new medium and figure out strategies for doing that. And I think that that was out, way outside many, pe many people's comfort zones. For the students, I think, you know, I think they're, given their generation and their, you know, I have, I have two teenagers, they're very used to video calls. And in fact, there's almost like this, <laughs> sometimes there's very little difference between like the interactive video world and then the real world. And, you know, so I think that maybe for them and that generation, it was a little bit different of a shift. I think maybe there was more loneliness, more separation, the lack of connection. I'm not so sure it was a comfort zone issue for them. Although mm. for some of them, for some of them, it probably was uh, now we're at least in my university, we're, we're sort of in hybrid mode. There are many classes that are in person. I, I just taught this morning in person. Um, you know, Matt, th that's outside my comfort zone speaking, <laughs> you know, with a KN95 mask on my mouth, you know, staying right. away from students and so on. But, you know, you, you do it. It's not that far outside my comfort zone. The, the essence of teaching and connecting with students is well. And after 20 years of doing this, it's well inside my comfort zone. It's something I love to do. So, yeah. My wife's a sixth grade teacher and she had to do the hybrid last year 
you know, so like you said, she has the mask on. She's got to teach the kids on Zoom. She's teaching the kids inside the classroom, but she has to stay away from them and she can't walk up to the desk and help them yeah. like she used to. And it was a real challenge. And she said, you know, she's like, Chris, I know you're the remote work guy and you love remote work, but I can't wait for this just, just for them to pick one. Like, I can't do both. I, it was too much. And her preference was, of course, because these are sixth graders or 12 year olds you know she'd rather have them all in class and be all yeah. there together uh to be able to learn together um uh, but yeah it was you know an, an interesting interesting time for her i think managing the hybrid class really takes like very keen technology and training i mean you have to have the right visuals the right training the right interface the right camera angles the right you know, the, the practice, the ability to connect and engage virtually and in person sort of simultaneously, you know, quasi simultaneously, that's a real skill. I haven't really done that yet. I've, I've gone one or the other. I've done remote, fully remote or fully in person. Um, I think there are pluses and minuses of, of each. Actually, it's really funny trying to learn students' names, trying to learn 30 new students' names um, from around the world. My students are all from around the world I, I, um, and, and they have, they've got masks on their faces. So it's like hard to learn their names. On, on Zoom, you, you have no masks and you have their names, like literally right next to their picture. So it's like they're pluses and minuses. Yeah, and that's tough because, you know, a lot of, for me, a lot of remembering names does connect to their face. Of course. And if they're wearing a mask, then it, it gets to be difficult. So, yeah. Um, you know, my wife has finally started admitting. She goes, you know, I've had so many students that now when they come back and they say hello, I don't always remember all their names and I feel guilty. But she's like, if I count them up, I've had like thousands of students. I mean, you just can't remember that many names, uh, you know, from that many kids. But <laughs> especially if you. I interacted with them through masks. I mean, it's like a, right. it's, it's a, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Whether it's outside my comfort zone. Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, there's the, there's the, you know, there's the health angle where, you know, I mean, there, there's the health angle that you're in a, you're in a closed classroom and there's COVID on the loose, you know, around, but, you know, but we've got really strong protocols at our university. Everyone needs to be vaccinated. We have testing once or twice a week. There's masking. So it's, you know, the protocols in place. Right. Right. Well, uh, one of the things that we love to ask uh, our guests are about maybe books that they're reading or books that they typically suggest uh, that our audience might want to check out. Um, obviously, we hope our, our audience will check out your first two books, uh, Global Dexterity and Reach. But aside from those, what other books are you have you had maybe some interest in recently? You know, I think uh, I think I, I'd like to recommend a book that um, is is uh, just more of one of my favorite all-time books as opposed to a, a recent book right. um and it's a book that i bet a lot of people in your audience haven't read it's called lost in translation and it's a great book um and it's a book we didn't talk much about the cultural angle today but a lot of my work is on helping people to adapt and adjust across cultures and this is an amazing story of a young woman a young girl from poland who moves to canada and builds a life and a career and about all the cultural differences and challenges um, it's a great book. Um, one of the most inspirational books that I, I, I read um, when I was getting into the field of intercultural communication. So that's 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 one you probably your audience probably hasn't heard of. Yeah, um, and I have actually uh, read that book. It's a really really good one. So I would second your recommendation. Uh, and this is why we asked this question. There was always somebody giving us a fantastic answer and a fantastic suggestion. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's important. I think if you're somebody who does want to, to do something a little bit different and you want to grow, if you want to step out of your comfort zone, uh, books are a fantastic place to start because you can learn lessons from other people. Uh, I learned so many lessons from books that I didn't have to go back and recreate that pain, right? I didn't have to go back and have that terrible experience because I could see what somebody else already did and how to avoid it and what I could learn. So uh, I really appreciate you bringing up that suggestion today. Great, yeah, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm, a f I'm a fan of that book for sure. So, how can people find out more about you? How can they uh, maybe find your books, or what's the best way for them to uh, interact with you if they're interested in your consulting, your coaching, all of that as well? 
Yeah, so so I'm very easy to find on the internet <laughs> if you just Google my name. Uh, but I also have a website, which is myname.com, andymolinsky.com, A-N-D-Y-M-O-L-I-N-S-K-Y.com. Um, and that's you'll find tons of stuff there. Well, really appreciate you being on the show today, Andy. Uh, I'll give you the final word. You know, if there's anything that you, you talked about today, if there's something that really you hope that people would hear or resonate with, what is it that you are hoping they will take away from our conversation today? I guess just the idea of balance. Like when you when people talk about comfort zones, if you Google it, if you look up memes, if you look up images, it's people jumping off bridges, out of planes, off cliffs, and you know, like mm. you have to get outside your comfort zone. I, I, I think I think moderation and balance is is the is this is the story here. You know, pick pick your spots, set yourself up for success, find situations that you want to work on, and work on those. And 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 I think what you'll do is you'll not only succeed, um, have some success at learning to step outside your comfort zone, but you'll start to have some more meta level success where you can start to learn about learning and learn what it entails so that you can then apply that to the next time around. Well, Andy, thank you so much for being our guest today and sharing some fantastic insights. Uh, thank you to everyone who's tuned into the show today, uh, wherever you did, whatever platform you may have found us. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and reach out if you have uh, questions or guest suggestions or topic suggestions. We'd love to hear from our audience. So uh, hopefully you've gained something you can use in your own career in a positive way. Uh, and uh, thanks again, Andy. And until next time, do what you love and show the world how talented you can be today. You've been listening to Talent Talk Radio, brought to you by People G2.